The United States and the Cold War, Part 2, Chapter 27, 1945-1953. The last lesson we discussed the beginnings of the Cold War and some of the reasons for the tension between Russia and the United States. We talked about the Berlin Airlift. And by 1949, things are starting to heat up a little bit because in September of 49, we discovered that Russia had tested her very own atomic bomb. We were no longer the only country that had them. And it's not going to be very long before you have, England's going to have them, France is going to have them. And once the secret's out there, it goes like a wildfire. Of course, the government had known for some time that the Russians had the secret, but we Americans didn't. And, and quite frankly, it, it scared the daylights out of most people because if the Russians, the people that we were so worried about in their communism, if they had the bomb, oh dear. So as a result of this, Truman authorized the formation of something called the Atomic Energy Commission to try to keep track of who had the bombs and how to regulate them and make things safe. But meanwhile, we do continue testing bombs. We even go to the hydrogen bomb. Now I'm going to do something different this time. Uh, I tried to put the YouTubes in the PowerPoint, which I can do when I show it in class. But every time I've tried to do it, when I upload it to YouTube, uh, I have trouble, but I think this is going to work. Uh, if for those of you not familiar with this, just press there one time. It'll come up. And uh, where is the one I want? Okay. That's a wide shot. That's not the one I wanted. Hmm. And then you want to make it big so you can see it. done we're going to hit escape to get out of it and that get back to here I could they also practiced testing on the hydrogen bomb which was even bigger and worse uh, the main reason I wanted to see you to see that is because quite honestly in the last few years we don't talk too much about atomic bombs or atomic energy it was horrifying and yet it reminds me of watching a snake they're terrifying yet they're almost fascinating you have to watch it and it's beautiful, and by the time that thing gets through going up, the mushroom cloud can be as high as 27 miles in height. And as much as 8 miles on either side of it will feel it. it. It's a very destructive weapon. And it's so bad, since so many people had them, we started having air raid drills in schools and out, and uh, shelters, storm shelters, not storm shelters, but uh, bomb shelters were sold. And a month later, is if Russia having her own bomb wasn't bad enough, Communist Mao Zedong took over control of China. Now, the gentleman he had outed is called Chiang Kai-shek. He was a nationalist leader, but he was a nice man, but not a very good leader. The conservatives in our government thought that President Truman had not done enough to help. And foreign service officers had been accused of uh, having communist sympathies because they didn't let us know. But we have records that the uh, foreign service officers had been warning us for years, even during World War II, they were warning us that Chiang Kai-shek was not a strong leader, that the billions of dollars we were sending over was not going to where it's supposed to, it was going to the pockets of his regime. So, the Senate claimed that we lost China because we put all the needs of England and France ahead of the needs of the United States. And my question is, how can you lose something that you never had in the first place? Of course, this is Mao Zedong, and he was not a charismatic type person, but he did rule with an iron fist, and it's amazing the things he accomplished in the years that he was in control of China. But as a result of all these things happening, Russia having the bomb and Mao Zedong taking over, 
The government issued something called the National Security uh, Committee, Document 68, claiming that the world was divided now between slavery and freedom, the slavery of communism or the freedom of democracy, Russia versus the United States. Now, originally, the Congress and the President had hoped to stop the proliferation and the spreading of communism by Soviets by using diplomacy. But now that they've got the bomb, we have to consider military action might be necessary. And if we're going to have to prepare for military action, we're going to increase our military and our budget. And, of course, we increase the defense budget. Also, we decided maybe we should become the policemen of the world. And anything that changed in Africa or Asia, it had to be the Soviets doing. 1950. What about Taiwan and Chiang Kai-shek? Well, Chiang Kai-shek took his small regime and retreated to the island of Taiwan just off of China. Now, some people in the government wanted to do spending, send the military and the navy over to make sure that China didn't invade Taiwan. Some said, let nature take its course. Uh, Darwinism, let, let him fall. If, if, if he's going to fall, let him go. There's a lot of hassle back and forth. Meanwhile, the country of Korea, whose neighbors are China, Japan, and Russia. Now, poor little Korea, uh, bless her heart, she's been invaded at one time or another for hundreds of years by all of her neighbors. And being under her own rule was something that was a rarity. And at the end of the war, she still wasn't going to be under her own control because Russia came in from the north, and the Allies came in from the south, and they, in effect, divided the country in half. The people of the north, where China, North Korea, were going to be ruled by a man called Kim Il-sung, who was a communist, and uh, supported by the Russians. In the south, it was a very conservative government, a man called Sigmund Rhee, which was a bad choice. He was an aristocrat who had no liking or use for the underclass, but we decided to back him because he was not communist. Now, the North, the Russians had really trained the military in the North and it helped them become a good militarized nation. But in the South, what we had done for the South is helped them become even more agrarian. And we didn't worry with their military, we just helped them become better farmers. And we didn't consider Korea even important enough to put in our defense perimeter. I mean, it's just, you know, a little nation out there. No worry about it. But on June the 25th, 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. And, of course, we were thoroughly convinced it was at the behest of Stalin. We didn't find out for decades that Stalin had tried to keep Kim Il-sung from doing it. He said no. And Kim Il-sung, being an egotistical little SOB, decided to do it anyway. Of course, the South Korean army collapsed almost immediately. And President Truman went before the UN to ask for aid to help South Korea because we couldn't have communists taking over South Korea. Well, Russia was on a bin and had been boycotting the UN, so therefore she wasn't there to use her veto power, so the UN okayed it. And although war was never declared, it was a police action under the cosmos of the United Nations. It's just a picture of some of the things that were going on. I mean, the poor people, their towns are devastated. General Douglas MacArthur was put in command because 95% of the participants were American. Uh, there were token people from other countries, and, and the Austries, Australians were the ones that produced the most. But China said, don't try to reunite Korea. And we just ignored them. After all, it's just China, you know, good gracious, they don't know nothing. And there was this little small probing attack, and we thought it was just a kind of a token attack, and we, just, we ignored them. Well... Then all of a sudden, Chinese soldiers poured by the thousands in and pushed the Union forces back, and it was quite a humiliating defeat for the United Nations and MacArthur in particular. So he demands that the Chinese surrender, or else we're going to drop the A bomb. Well, the president had been working behind the scenes to get a ceasefire and just go back to the way things were. Let's just stop this war. And I mean, North be North and South be South. But General MacArthur disagreed with him publicly and started talking about the only way to get rid of him was to bomb. So President Truman orders him to Washington to discuss this problem, because when you're in the military, you do not badmouth or disagree with your commanding officer, the president. He arrived to a hero's welcome in California, and all along the way across the country to Washington, he stopped and made speeches, and he was very well loved by the people, especially the military. And he gets to Washington, and President Truman tries to explain to him that this is not the time or the place to draw a line in the sand with China. It was Russia we'd been worried about, and now all of a sudden China's in the mix. Well, he didn't agree with him, and he argued with him, and when the other 
generals of the other military forces tried to explain to him this is not the time or the place, uh, MacArthur was fired. He was relieved of his command and requested that he retire. Well, if you've ever watched MASH, you know how it was crazy over there. Uh, a lot of the stuff they show you was pretty true. But it did stabilize, and after two years of non-productive negotiation, sometimes they would argue for days over who's going to sit in what chair. But it finally ended, and to this day, Korea is still divided at a 38th parallel. And we do have some troops over there. So what were the results of the war? Other than civilians being killed and villages destroyed and land torn up, well, it legitimized the United Nations as a peacekeeper. It seems like an oxymoron, a peacekeeper using force and guns. And it began a two-decade-long siege of hostility between China and the United States. Meanwhile, the U.S. begins to aid French, the French for the, uh, they're still colonials and they still have a lot of claims in French Indochina. But you've got to realize that the Cold War had completely transformed American life. Society was permanently militarized now, and the military-industrial complex forged by World War II persisted and expanded. The U.S. retained a very large and active federal government, which was spending millions of dollars on weapons and overseas bases. See, national security justified enormous government projects and expenditures. It also included aid to higher education, the building of the national highway system, but the downside was it made government officials a little bit secretive and dishonest, leading, for example, to the cover-up of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons testing conducted on our soldiers and on civilians. Cold War spending fostered economic growth, yes. It sponsored economic and technological innovations and greatly shaped the civilian life, especially in medicine and computers and aircraft and anything to do with technology. The Cold War, like World War II, created a culture where sharply the, the decision to be loyal, you had to be loyal to the government and you had to be able to determine who was loyal and who was not loyal. And we saw an awful lot of our civil liberties go. But the U.S., like I said, began to aid France. And then we decided to rearm West Germany, which really, really upset everybody, especially East Germany and the Russians. We have another what we call Red Scare. Remember, we had one right after World War I, too. Back in '47, President Truman had created a loyalty review system in which federal employees had to prove their devotion to America without even knowing who was accusing them of disloyalty and on what basis. Of course, no espionage was ever revealed. But hundreds lost their jobs or resigned rather than be investigated. That same year, the House Un-American Activities Committee began to hold hearings about communist influence in Hollywood. And celebrities and writers and directors were all forced to appear before the committee or face punishment. Though there were some, like Ronald Reagan, who alleged that the entertainment industry was rift with communism. Some refused to testify, claiming that they were vi being violated of their constitutional protection for free speech and political association. And there was a group called the Hollywood Ten who went to jail for contempt of Congress, and then Hollywood blacklisted them and hundreds of others who were accused of communist sympathies or simply refused to identify alleged communists that they'd had to think of anything about. And here we go again. Click there. Comes up. Okay, now we're going to make it larger. Attention! Attention! This is an official civil defense warning. This is not a test. The United States is under nuclear attack. Take cover immediately in your area of fallout shelter. Repeat, the United States is under nuclear attack. America's Cold War years were filled with fear. Daily radio and newspaper reports blared frightening stories of advancing communism, imminent nuclear war, and Soviet spies. America responded with an all-out offensive against communist infiltration. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well-informed witnesses testifying is J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
Mr. Hoover speaks with authority on the subject. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. While Hoover's FBI worked behind the scenes, Congress expanded its own high-profile investigations, often ignoring the civil rights of the accused. Are you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I believe I have the right to be confronted with any evidence which supports this question. I should like to see what you have. Oh, well, you would, yes. Yeah. Beginning in 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, investigated communist influence in Hollywood. The committee was concerned with the power of movies to persuade audiences with subversive messages. With movie stars and other industry professionals called to testify, the hearings became red carpet events. For the anti-communist witch hunt, it was a publicity bonanza. It is completely uh, against the un-American feeling, this communistic thing. I believe I would, I would move to the state of Texas if it ever came here, because I think the Texans would kill them on sight. <laughs> we have sold them some films. A good many years ago, uh, they bought the Three Little Pigs and used it to Russia. If I had my way about it, they'd all be sent back to Russia or some other unpleasant place. Most witnesses cooperated with the committee. However, a small group who became known as the Hollywood Ten refused to answer questions, citing protection under the First Amendment. Among them, screenwriter John Howard Lawson. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen can frame his then answer. You denied, the then you denied, then you... Absolutely invade. Then you deny to you you refuse to answer that question. Is that correct? I have told you that I will offer right. my beliefs, my affiliations, and Here's everything else Here's to the, the American public, and they will know where I stand, as they do from what I have written. Stand away I from have the stand. Up for Americanism for many years, and I stand away from, from the stand. For the Bill of Rights, I'll stand away from it. Therefore, it is the unanimous opinion of this subcommittee. John Howard Lawson is in contempt of Congress. The Hollywood Ten were convicted of contempt and sent to prison. Thousands of others were blacklisted by the studios, forcing many talented movie makers into exile and obscurity. Among the friendly witnesses who testified in 1947 was a B-movie actor named Ronald Reagan. No one could have suspected that four decades later, Reagan would play a leading role in bringing the Cold War to an end. If communists have attempted to inject their propaganda into the motion picture, they have failed miserably. Perhaps Hollywood wasn't influenced by communists, but it was affected by the hearings. Movie studios added to the hysteria by cranking out such anti-communist films as Is This Tomorrow, Red Planet Mars, and dozens of others. But tawdry films did little to distract President Truman from what he saw as a perversion of American democracy. Now I'm going to tell you how we're not going to fight communism. We're not going to transform our fine FBI into a Gestapo secret police. We're not going to try to control what our people read and say and think. We're not going to turn the United States into a right-wing totalitarian country in order to deal with a left-wing totalitarian threat. In short, we're not going to end democracy. We're going to keep the Bill of Rights on the books. Against the president's objections, Congress passed more dubious legislation, including the Internal Security Bill of 1950, which empowered the government to take action against anyone it deemed a security risk. Truman called it the greatest danger to freedom of speech, press, and assembly since the Alien and Sedition Laws of 1798. to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, back to the uh, PowerPoint. Before we go on, uh, <laughs> you got to see J. Edgar Hoover there. Um, 
or cross-dressing FBI director. He, the problem is when he started out, he was, he was very true to what he believed. He, he thought he was doing the best, but power corrupts people and he's got too power hungry. And of course you saw Bogey and, and I look, recall there, I got a picture that's coming up too, right here, I think. Let's see if I can get to it. The two in the front, that's Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, one of the most famous actors in Hollywood. By the way, there was also uh, a TV show in the early 50s in black and white called My Three Lives about an ordinary American. He was one life. He worked in a factory somewhere. That's his first life. His second life was he was a communist and went to communist cell meetings. And his third life was he was an FBI informer. And I tell you, it was, it was quite the dude. Everybody was watching it. But with all these stuff going on and there were several high-profile cases as it exacerbated it um, for instance Whitaker Chambers uh, who was a magazine editor for Time tells that in the 1930s a man called Alger Hiss a State Department official had given him secret documents to give the Soviets of course Hiss denied it but he was convicted of perjury and served five years in jail and the Truman administration began putting all communist leaders on trial for advocating revolution and several were even imprisoned and in 1951, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, a working-class Jewish couple who happened to be communists, living in New York, were convicted of conspiring to pass secrets about the atomic bomb to the Soviets during World War II. The evidence against them was deemed way too secret to be revealed at that time, but it later became clear that Julius Rosenberg had not given the secret of the bomb to the Soviets. It had been an English scientist. And there was no evidence to support any charges against his wife, Ethel. But even though their charges were less serious than spying or treason, the judge said that they had helped to cause the Korean War and were sentenced to death and they were executed in electric chair at 53. And whether or not Ethel Rosenberg or Alger Hiss were actually guilty, their crimes only seemed to strengthen our sense of a massive spy network in the U.S. And of course, this climate of fear allowed this junior senator from Wisconsin to become a very serious anti-communist crusader. He had run when he first came back from the war uh, on the strength of his war record. They called him Tail Gunner Joe and being he called himself a Mick from the backwoods. He was Catholic and he ran on, like I said, on his war record. Well, the, the irony was he was supposed to have been a tail gunner on a bomber during World War II, but he had been working as a typist in the motor pool. But it doesn't matter. It's time for him to run again. And he's got to have something to, you know, get the people stirred up. So he decides to go on the anti-communist crusade. And he was asked to deliver a speech to a women's uh, Republican club. And when he was there, he claimed to have a list of 205 communists employed by the State Department. He never identified anyone. But he used his position to start holding hearings and alleged disloyalty at the Defense Department and any other government agency. And some Republicans actually embraced him because it was a way to, well, get back at Truman. And even after Truman didn't run for re-election again, and in 1952, a Republican, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was elected. And he tried to put a little bit of a damper on it, but it didn't seem to work. Two years later, we've got television now, folks. And we start having televised hearings of Senate investigations. And McCarthy is exposed. He's, he's shown as a bully. So once the American public saw him, it's kind of like when you ask someone, do you still beat your wife? Well, how are you going to answer that? You can't say, no, I don't still beat my wife. I never did beat my wife. And they go, uh-huh, uh-huh. If you say, yes, I still beat her, well, you know, it's, it's, there's no way you can write answer to answer that question. And he would ask you a question similar to that. And before you could even answer, he'd jump all over you. He was a bully. And the American public lost interest in him when he started seeing how bad he was. And even the Republic Senate condemned his actions, and he did not win re-election, and he died three years later. So McCarthyism has come to refer to the abuse of power in the name of anti-communism, or simply a witch hunt. And here's a picture of him. I think it's also one like this in your textbook. Of a, that it bored. You can see how bored that man on the left is. I mean, oh my gosh, what's he going to talk about now? Uh, this is 54, and they were televised, and everybody was glued to their television sets.
there were some spies, yes. But there weren't enough to endanger our security. And most of them had been jailed or fired in the McCarthy area. And they weren't even guilty of holding, doing anything and having unpopular beliefs. Anti-communism was a very popular movement, and it had its uses. One use was that any ethnic groups rooted in Eastern Europe countries dominated by the Soviets, like the Polish, or the American Catholics who opposed communism, hostility to religion, and government agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation, led by our J. Edgar Hoover, they used anti-communism to increase his own power. And it could be used for purely partisan political purposes. McCarthy and the other anti-communist leaders seemed to criticize the legacy of Roosevelt and the New Deal more than they did criticize Stalin and communism. And while many Democrats embraced anti-communism to deflect Republican allegations of disloyalty, the Democrats began to exclude many in the left and the popular front who would have organized support for New Deal policies. Anti-communism made conformity the new definition of loyalty. And any criticism of the status quo now appeared to be subversive. Businesses used anti-communism against the unions. White supremacists used anti-communism against the black civil rights leaders. And it was even used sometimes to, well, you weren't allowed to do anything different. You had to conform. Uh, they used it to defend sexual morality and, and the traditional gender roles against feminism and homosexuality. But it was most persuasive between 1940 and the early 60s and shaped our American politics and cultures. And of course, the Republicans invoked communism to stifle Truman's political plans. Yeah, I had it myself, didn't I? Okay, I'll leave it up there for a minute or two for you. In 50, Truman vetoed a measure that required subversive groups to register to be denied passports and to authorize them to be deported uh, on his authority. But Congress overrode his veto and, and enacted. And in 52, a new immigration law passed over Truman's veto, which shot down Truman's proposal for immigration reform. It allowed the deportation of communists, even if they were citizens. Two years later, the federal government's Operation Wetback resulted in the military deportation of about a million Mexican-Americans allegedly illegal aliens. What did he get done? Well, he, he barely got the Social Security coverage expanded, and instead of getting federal social welfare, uh, private work welfare was going to prevail. The health care, well, it seems that union workers' contracts provided them with health insurance and wage increases that caused the cost of living, COLA, cost of living allowance, pensions and paid vacations. And while all other employees remain semi-covered, but only the workers in the heavily unionized industries enjoyed these. Um, most of the American workers were not, and did not get these benefits at all. All political and social groups had to comply with anti-communism or be destroyed. Of course, this damaged the labor and civil rights movements, and because they had benefited from dedicated communist organizers. And after the 1947 passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, it withdrew bargaining rights and legal protection from unions whose leaders refused to swear that they weren't communist. The CIO expelled left-wing unions with almost a million members. So the unions began to support the Cold War and U.S. foreign politics. And since left-wingers were often the most militant advocates of women's rights and civil rights, their expulsion left unions unable to respond to the civil rights movement and an economy that shifted from manufacturing to service work. But the civil rights movement changed. While major civil rights groups at first protested Truman's loyalty program, and they criticized anti-communists for not defining racism as un-American, nearly all black leaders in civil rights organizations were pressured into joining the anti-communist crusade. Groups like the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, which had really united communists and non-communists, kind of in a struggle for racial equality and social justice, they disintegrated which only left the one legitimate group, the NAACP. So black organizations adopted the Cold War language to begin to argue that segregation and racism in the U.S. had gave credence to what the Soviets were saying of America, and thus helped solidify the Cold War understanding of freedom. So in a climate of anti-communism and McCarthyism, 
criticisms of American policy, foreign or domestic, invited a harsh response. And Truman's civil rights program kind of faltered. But the booming economy of the 50s, which was producing a very affluent society in America for the first time, it began producing a widening gap between the white affluence and black poverty and disenfranchisement that's going to help inspire a civil rights resurgence in the 1960s. Now I've got a YouTube here for you. Uh, it's basically a review of what we've done in the last two chapters. It's, Mr. Green's going to tell you in a different way. So don't sign off as soon as you get through watching. I've got a couple more things to tell you. And we want him in the green shirt. Here we see what we want. And we're going to make this big. Hi, I'm John Green. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to talk about the Cold War. The Cold War is called cold because it supposedly never heated up into actual armed conflict, which means, you know, that it wasn't a war. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, but if the war on Christmas is a war and the war on drugs is a war... You're not going to hear me say this often in your life, me from the past, but that was a good point. At least the Cold War was not an attempt to make war on a noun, which almost never works because nouns are so resilient. And to be fair, the Cold War did involve quite a lot of actual war from Korea to Afghanistan as the world's two superpowers, the United States and the USSR, sought ideological and strategic influence throughout the world. So perhaps it's best to think of the Cold War as an era, lasting roughly from 1945 to 1990. Discussions of the Cold War tend to center on international and political history, and those are very important, which is why we've talked about them in the past. This, however, is United States history, so let us heroically gaze, as Americans so often do, at our own navel. Stan, why did you turn the globe to the green parts of not America? I mean, I guess to be fair, we were a little bit obsessed with this guy. So the Cold War gave us great spy novels, independence movements, an arms race, cool movies like Dr. Strangelove and War Games, one of the most evil mustaches in history. But it also gave us a growing awareness that the greatest existential threat to human beings is ourselves. It changed the way we imagined the world and humanity's role in it. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, William Faulkner famously said, our tragedy today is a general and universal physical fear so long sustained by now that we can even bear it. There are no longer problems of the spirit. There is only the question, when will I be blown up? So today we're going to look at how that came to be the dominant question of human existence and whether we can ever get past it. So after World War II, the U.S. and the USSR were the only two nations with any power left. The United States was a lot stronger. We had atomic weapons, for starters, and also the Soviets had lost 20 million people in the war, and they were led by a sociopathic mustachioed Joseph Stalin. But the U.S. still had worries. We needed a strong, free market-oriented Europe, and to a lesser extent Asia, so that all the goods we were making could find happy homes. The Soviets, meanwhile, were concerned with something more immediate, a powerful Germany invading them again. Germany, and please do not take this personally, Germans, was very, very slow to learn the central lesson of world history, do not invade Russia, unless you're the Mongols. So at the end of World War II, the USSR encouraged the creation of pro-communist governments in Bulgaria, Romania, and Poland, which was a relatively easy thing to encourage because those nations were occupied by Soviet troops. The idea for the Soviets was to create a communist buffer between them and Germany, but to the US it looked like communism might just keep expanding, and that would be really bad for us because who would buy all of our sweet, sweet industrial goods? So America responded with the policy of containment, as introduced in diplomat George F. Kennan's famous Long Telegram. Communism could stay where it was, but it would not be allowed to spread. And ultimately, this is why we fought very real wars in both Korea and Vietnam. As a government report from 1950 put it, the goals of containment were, one, block further expansion of Soviet power, two, expose the falsities of Soviet pretensions, three, induce a retraction of the Kremlin's control and influence, and four, in general, foster the seeds of destruction within the Soviet system. Harry Truman, who, as you'll recall, became president in 1945 after Franklin Delano, 
Delano Prez for Life Roosevelt died, was a big fan of containment, and the first real test of it came in Greece and Turkey in 1947. This was a very strategically valuable region because it was near the Middle East, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but the United States has been just like a smidge interested in the Middle East the last several decades because of oil, glorious oil. Right, so Truman announced the so-called Truman Doctrine because, you know, why not name a doctrine after yourself, in which he pledged to support, quote, freedom-loving peoples against communist threats, which is all fine and good, but who will protect us against peoples, the pluralization of an already plural noun? Anyway, we eventually sent $400 million in aid to Greece and Turkey, and we were off to the Cold War races. The Truman Doctrine created the language through which Americans would view the world, with America as free and communists as tyrannical. According to our old friend Eric Foner, the speech set a precedent for American assistance to anti-communist regimes throughout the world, no matter how undemocratic, and for the creation of a set of global military alliances directed against the Soviet Union. It also led to the creation of a new security apparatus, the National Security Council, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Atomic Energy Commission, all of which were somewhat immune from government oversight and definitely not democratically elected. And the containment policy and the Truman Doctrine also laid the foundations for a military buildup, an arms race, which would become a key feature of the Cold War. But it wasn't all about the military, at least at first. Like, the Marshall Plan was first introduced at Harvard's commencement address in June 1947 by, get this, George Marshall, in what turned out to be, like, the second most important commencement address in all of American history. Yes, yes, Stan, okay. That, it was a great speech, thank you for noticing. All right, let's go to the thought bubble. The Marshall Plan was a response to economic chaos in Europe, brought on by a particularly harsh winter that strengthened support for communism in France and Italy. The plan sought to use U.S. aid to combat the economic instability that provided fertile fields for communism. As Marshall said, our policy is not directed against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. Basically, it was a new deal for Europe, and it worked. Western Europe was rebuilt so that by 1950, production levels in industry had eclipsed pre-war levels, and Europe was on its way to becoming a U.S.-style capitalist mass consumer society, which it still is, kind of. Japan, although not technically part of the Marshall Plan, was also rebuilt. General Douglas MacArthur was basically the dictator there, forcing Japan to adopt a new constitution, giving women the vote, and pledging that Japan would forswear war, in exchange for which the United States effectively became Japan's defense force. This allowed Japan to spend its money on other things like industry, which worked out really well for them. Meanwhile, Germany was experiencing the first Berlin crisis. At the end of the war, Germany was divided into East and West, and even though the capital, Berlin, was entirely in the East, it was also divided into East and West. This meant that West Berlin was dependent on shipments of goods from West Germany through East Germany, and then in 1948, Stalin cut off the roads to West Berlin. So the Americans responded with an 11-month-long airlift of supplies that eventually led to Stalin lifting the blockade in 1948 and building the Berlin Wall, which stood until 1991 when Kool-Aid got... No, wait, 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 wait. That wasn't when the Berlin Wall was built. That was in 1961. I just wanted to give Thought Bubble the opportunity to make that joke. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So, right, the wall wasn't built until 1961, but 1949 did see Germany officially split into two nations, and also the Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb, and NATO was established, and the Chinese Revolution ended in communist victory. So by the end of 1950, the contours of the Cold War had been established. West versus East, capitalist freedom versus communist totalitarianism. At least from where I'm sitting. Although now apparently I'm going to change where I'm sitting, because it's time for the mystery document. The rules here are simple. I guess the author of the mystery document, and about 55% of the time I get shocked by the shock pen. We must organize and enlist the energies and resources of the free world in a positive program for peace, which will frustrate the Kremlin design for world domination by creating a situation in the free world to which the Kremlin will be compelled to adjust. Without such a cooperative effort led by the United States, we will have to make gradual withdrawals under pressure until we discover one day that we have sacrificed positions of vital interest. It is imperative that this trend be reversed by a much more rapid and concerted buildup of the actual strength of both the United States and the other nations of the free world. I mean, all I can say about it is that it sounds American and like it was written in like 1951 and it seems kind of like a policy paper or something really boring. So I, I mean, yeah, I'm just gonna have to take the shock. <laughs>
<laughs> National Security Council report to NSC 68. Are you kidding me, Stan? Not, not 64 or 81, 68. This is ridiculous. I called injustice. Anyway, as the apparently wildly famous NSC 68 shows, the U.S. government cast the Cold War as a rather epic struggle between freedom and tyranny, and that led to remarkable political consensus. Both Democrats and Republicans supported most aspects of Cold War policy, especially the military buildup part. Now, of course, there were some critics, like Walter Lippmann, who worried that casting foreign policy in such stark ideological terms would result in the U.S. getting on the wrong side of many conflicts, especially as former colonies sought to remove the bonds of empire and become independent nations. But yeah, no, nothing like that ever happened. Yeah, I mean, it's not like that happened in Iran or Nicaragua or Argentina or Brazil or Guatemala, or Stan, are you really going to make me list all of them? Fine. Or Haiti, or Paraguay, or the Philippines, or Chile, or Iraq, or Indonesia, or Zaire. I'm sorry, there are a lot of them, okay? But these interventions were viewed as necessary to prevent the spread of communism, which was genuinely terrifying to people, and it's important to understand that. Like, national security agencies pushed Hollywood to produce anti-communist movies like The Red Menace, which scared people, and the CIA funded magazines, news broadcasts, concerts, art exhibitions that gave examples of America American freedom. It even supported painters like Jackson Pollock and the Museum of Modern Art in New York because American Expressionism was the vanguard of artistic freedom and the exact opposite of Soviet socialist realism. I mean, have you seen Soviet paintings? Look at the hardy ankles on these socialist comrade peasants. Also, because the Soviets were atheists, at least in theory, Congress in 1954 added the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance as a sign of America's resistance to communism. The Cold War also shaped domestic policy, anti-communist sentiment for instance, prevented Truman from extending the social policies of the New Deal. The program that he dubbed the Fair Deal would have increased the minimum wage, extended national health insurance, and increased public housing, social security, and aid to education. But the American Medical Association lobbied against Truman's plan for national health insurance by calling it socialized medicine. And Congress was in no mood to pay money for socialized anything. That problem goes away. But the government did make some domestic investments as a result of the Cold War. In the name of national security, the government spent money on education, research and science, technology like computers, and transportation infrastructure. In fact, we largely have the Cold War to thank for our marvelous interstate highway system, although part of the reason Congress approved it was to set up speedy evacuation routes in the event of nuclear war. And speaking of nuclear war, it's worth noting that a big part of the reason the Soviets were able to develop nuclear weapons so quickly was thanks to espionage, like, for instance, by physicist and spy Klaus Fuchs. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Fuchs worked on the Manhattan Project and leaked information to the Soviets and then later helped the Chinese to build their first bomb. Julius Rosenberg also gave atomic secrets to the Soviets and was eventually executed, as was his less clearly guilty wife, Ethel. And it's important to remember all that when thinking about the United States' obsessive fear that there were communists in our midst. This began in 1947 with Truman's loyalty review system, which required government employees to prove their patriotism when accused of disloyalty. How do you prove your loyalty? Rat out your co-workers as communists. No, seriously though, that program never found any communists. This all culminated, of course, with the Red Scare and the rise of Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy, an inveterate liar who became enormously powerful after announcing in February 1950 that he had a list of 205 communists who worked in the State Department. In fact, he had no such thing, and McCarthy never identified a single disloyal American, but the fear of communism continued. In 1951's Dennis versus United States, the Supreme Court upheld the notion that being a communist leader itself was a crime. In this climate of fear, any criticism of the government and its policies, or the U.S. in general, was seen as disloyalty. There was only one question, when will I be blown up? And it encouraged loyalty because only the government could prevent the spread of communism and keep us from being blown up. We've talked a lot about different ways that Americans have imagined freedom this year, but this was a new definition of freedom. The government exists in part to keep us free from massive destruction. So the Cold War changed America profoundly. The U.S. has remained a leader on the world stage and continued to build a large, powerful, and expensive national state, but it also changed the way we imagine what it means to be free and what it means to be safe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is created by all of these nice people, and it is possible because of you and your support through Subbable.com. Subbable is a crowdfunding website that allows you to support stuff you love on a monthly basis. Our Subbable subscribers make this show possible. Thanks to them. If you value Crash Course, please check out our Subbable. There are great perks there. And thanks to all of you for watching. As we say in my hometown, don't forget to be awesome. Wait, 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 wait. Stan, is that music copyrighted?
right. All right. Nice. Not. Whew. Let's save this thousand dollars. <coughs> and back we go. Escape, and and back we go here. Uh, what I wanted to remind you was that um, this, of course, finishes the chapter on the Cold War. I split it up because I wanted you to be able to get the full impact of unreasonable fear. Uh, I lived in a little town called Geneva, Kentucky, and we were thoroughly convinced that there were communists under the paper bed. I mean, the government was telling us so, and Senator McCarthy was telling us so. So we were victims of our own propaganda. <coughs> But the next chapter, chapter 28, is called uh, The Confident Years, and it's the 50s, and it's one of my favorite chapters of the entire book. We get to hear some rock and roll music, and I get to tell you about me growing up in the 50s. Of course, I was just a wee child then, but I think the next chapter will be more fun than this chapter was for you. But thank you for listening. <laughs>